Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein. Welcome to American Architecture Now. Today we'll be talking to Peter Eisenman and Jack Robertson. Fifteen years ago, the collaboration of architects Peter Eisenman and Jack Robertson would have been highly unlikely. In the 1960s, Jack Robertson was often referred to as Mayor Lindsay's golden boy, an expert urban designer and planner, while Peter Eisenman was a favorite of architecture's avant-garde. Currently, they are partners at Eisman Robertson Architects and at Design Development Resources. A very warm welcome to the both of you. In view of your past experiences, what has changed to make your recent collaboration desirable or even possible? We're older. I was going to say the same thing. <coughs> Grown up. Grown up. And I think also we've identified certain things that we think are important that we can probably achieve together better than singly. Are you an odd couple or is it a good balance? We're an odd couple and therefore a good balance. <laughs> what does that mean, Jack? Well, Peter and I share certain fundamental interests uh, about institutions, structure of society, very formal attitudes of thought, uh, and the importance of architecture being a vehicle for both ideas and for particularly ideas about society. And Peter and I have known each other since Cambridge, England, 1961. I was my first job out, out of architecture school and Peter was getting his PhD in architecture at Cambridge and we were two Yanks abroad and we became quite close friends then. I was a member of the group called the Five Architects, or I was with five other architects, it really wasn't a group. And it was very interesting because Jack was one of the people who wrote a response to that book in um, architectural form. In fact, the Institute's first job was given to us by Jack at the Urban Design Group. And I think that Jack is, uh, for me, one of the few people I could always talk to about architecture. Even though we never agreed, we agreed to disagree, let's say. And today still remains that. Uh, for me, a very important catalyst, critic, uh, corrector, refiner. Both of you have long been involved in education as well at very different kinds of institutions. Should a school of architecture advocate one particular approach? Depends on what the approach is. By and large, people, teachers in schools and deans of schools do have strong prejudices. I have them. I'm deeply committed to urbanism. Someone what else. What does urbanism mean to you, particularly when you spend a good part of your time in some of the most beautiful and rural part of our country? Ooh. What does that mean? Ooh. Well, but you have to understand, I spent 20 years in one of the most exciting cities in the world. Uh, Charlottesville, Jefferson's plan is one of the three best urban Urbanism. plans in the United States. Yeah. Charleston and Savannah, Williamsburg and the University of Virginia, the three most important urban plans in America. Uh, so I look at Charlottesville as a generic type of American urbanism. Uh, it's in a beautiful yeah. natural setting. And what was your deep commitment, your focus at the Institute, Peter? I think ours was more proselytizing architecture. I think we were taking the kinds of students we had there were students that were basically in liberal arts institutions. They were not professional. We were never concerned with the training of professionals. What we were interested in doing is taking young people before they had a commitment to anything and exposing them to how to think visually. There's an area that we really share in common because really in Charlottesville, what we emphasize at the University of Virginia is first the architect as a man who understands the world with a very strong liberal arts base, not a professional first, a man to the world man of his time first, and then an architect. And architecture always in the service of life, not the other way around. Most people think of Virginia as the mother of presidents, and you, Jack, have referred to it as the mother of architecture. What prompts that attitude, and what is Virginia's traditional position? It's the mother of presidents and of architecture. <laughs> uh, it's the oldest colony, probably has the best inventory of buildings and gardens and landscape conceived together in the United States. As Jefferson said, you use architecture in the young republic as a way to teach 
people about the arts, and architecture is the way to do it, because you'll never have enough paintings in a young country. How do you manage to combine a commercial practice in New York City with your academic commitment in Virginia? I spend four to five days a week in Charlottesville and the weekends plus a Monday or Friday in New York. It's a long tradition of teaching deans. My sense is that the best teachers uh, are people who are practicing architects. I think the two inform each other and I think that one of the problems in practice is there's too little theory in a sense and in the school there's too little practice and, and I think what Jack's and our commitment is is to find that middle ground. Along about 15 years ago, the two of you, I believe, were involved in a symposium, the Museum of Modern Art, at the time of a significant exhibition. You've got to go back to 64, when Jack and I were involved with a group of young architects called the Case Group. Probably every leading light today in the country was at one time or another involved in that group. Only they, we were all very young and wet behind the ears, and we'd go and meet in the country, no publicity, nothing, and talk architecture. I think it's one of the first times that it ever happened in this country. Who are some I, of the people involved? Well, Bob Venturi, uh, Richard Meyer, um, Michael, Graves. Michael Graves, Tim Vreeland, uh, Charles Moore, uh, Mike McKinnell, there were any, Colin Rove and Scully, any number of people. And that honed a capacity to mutually criticize one another. Michael Graves and I at the time, funnily enough, were designing a city to stretch between New York and, and Philadelphia. I mean, that's the kind of crazy things that were going on in, in 1965. By the way, how far did you get with Michael Graves in that uh, mythical city? <laughs> got money out of the feds, I remember. Yeah, we got a lot of money. I mean, we were, we were <laughs> milking money out of everybody we could. <laughs> Uh, it, was, it was a time when people were listening to crazy kids. Barbara Lee, let me go back to the museum mm -hmm. show because it's important. The museum show really did, was, was a kind of origin in, in both Peter's and my separate careers because Peter and Michael did a quite an elegant, highly theoretical scheme for the river and Jonathan and Richard and Gio and I did a what we thought was a nuts and bolts very hard hitting practical solution to deck the Park Avenue railroad track. At the end of that show Peter and I were talking one day over a cup of coffee and Peter says listen why don't you join me I'm going to start an institute. And I said Peter why don't you join me we're putting together a group that will work for the city on practical problems and we went and created these two new institutions which were really examining the same set of issues from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Us very pragmatic and obsessed with trying to understand how the world worked. Peter trying to bring theory and ideas back into the practice of architecture. Let's talk about some of the things you did during that period, at that <coughs> very same time when you were the director of the Office of Midtown Planning, which was newly created, the, I guess the very end of the 1960s, about 1969. One of the things that your group suggested was a plan that created a mall for Madison Avenue. We proposed a set of green streets, as it were, in the most congested areas, the first one of which to be tested was Madison Avenue. It was very hard to conceive of that as standing alone. It had to be seen as part of a larger plan. That was defeated by Mr. Manis by one vote in the Board of Estimate, one of the stupidest bloody votes ever taken in the city, because it was a very, very important test. What we proposed, and we were at the cutting edge then, was enacted by almost every other city in the world of doing special bus streets, uh, pedestrian transit streets with wider sidewalks, nice trees, good paving. You say that one vote was a crucial test. What did you learn from that experience? How to take your lumps. Some of the most important public policies are impossible to carry in a city like New York uh, because people change votes at the last minute. Manis had said he was with us, I'm with you, and the next day he got visited by the taxi lobby and he spun around on a dime and changed his mind. Uh, you can't control that. And it's almost impossible now to point to an attractive urban environment being produced by the system. It's a really horrifying problem. If you go to Phoenix or even Houston, which mm. Phoenix is a poor version of it and Houston's a rich version of it, it's garbage. 
You know, it's expensive garbage or it's cheap garbage, but it's garbage. You have to have and an what's eye. the key? The key is having some reasonable notion of what an acceptable order for so many people living in a certain area is. And most successful cities have been based on a consensus about what that reasonable order is. And we don't have that right now. Jack, you were born in China eventually a Rhodes Scholar, lived in the Middle East. You say, at least since you've been back there, that you are really a Virginian. How has being raised there influenced your ideas, and is there a particular architect, critic, historian, statesman, architect, farmer, who particularly <laughs> influenced you? I obviously like Jefferson very much uh, as a statesman, uh, as an idealist as a practical man of affairs and clearly as an architect. What can Jefferson's work to begin with teach today's architect? How to concentrate on essential issues. University of Virginia is the clearest example in the United States of ideas about how men and women live together and that putting that into physical form. It's absolutely modern, complex. It has nothing to do with time or nostalgia. Well, along about the time that I was living in Charlottesville, you were gathering together a <laughs> loosely knit group of like-minded architects. I'm thinking of Michael Graves and Charles Grothme and John Hayduck and Richard Meyer, who were interested in a purely formal approach to architecture. You made some reference earlier to the group, and was it ever really a group? Very quickly. Uh, that group came out of the, the, uh, this case group that we talked about before, and what happened was after eight or nine meetings, the groups splintered apart, and we got tired of talking, I guess, and... Wanted to fight. <laughs> we got tired of fighting, I guess. And by that time, each of us had done a, a house, uh, and we said we want to Real show or on pace? No, real, 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 built houses. And we said, look, we wanted to uh, show our work and discuss real work. And Arthur Drexler hosted the meeting at the Museum of Modern Art, and Ken Frampton made the, the introduction, and Arthur Drexler the concluding remarks, and it was a very heavy thing for five young people. I, at that time, Charles Grothme and John Haydick, we hardly knew them because they weren't in this case group, and they, we just needed to get more than Richard and Michael and myself. And so we added the, the two of them. The whole idea of the book, I have to tell you, and the, the five is, is purely media. We published 500 copies because we never thought it would be uh, anything like a bestseller. Gave our rights away, cost us a lot of money, and we said that was it. And then um, we hyped it. We got Stern to put together his group of five, and then Paul Goldberger picked it up, as was his want, because he would, you know, critics got to make a living. And suddenly it was the New York Five. And we'd never thought who of this. Who called it the New York Five? Paul Goldberger Five. called it the New York Five. Well, at that very same time, Jack, you were one of those who disagreed with the approach of the so-called New York Five. You said that the work raised several questions. To begin with, was the architecture of this group one of drawing or of living? You asked also how their type of building would age, both physically and stylistically. I wonder if you would consider what you said then and tell us if your answer is different now. No. <clears throat> A critique stands. The only one of the five that profoundly interested me was Peter, as I said in the review. I said his work was of an entirely different nature, and he was investigating at a very deep level certain central issues that related structure and particularly the structure of semantics, language, both of us were interested in linguistic mm -hmm. philosophy, to architectural issues. You the, did praise Peter Eisen yeah. even then for breaking yeah. new ground, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you said, for trying to bring architectural theory up to date. Is that what you were trying to do? Very, very clear, coal-headed logic. I said, I want to learn about what architecture is because I didn't know what it was, and I thought the best way to do that was to teach students. And they began asking me questions about well, why is this good or that bad, and I didn't have any answers. And slowly, I evolved a, an idea about what architecture was, and I wanted to experiment with it. And I happened to be very lucky to find some clients that were willing to let me experiment and build houses that are, were very uh, experimental. But 
I never thought I was really evolving a theory. I thought I was trying to learn how to make architecture, and I still think I am. One of the designs that you, Jack, have identified as one of your very best designs, and that was the 1975 plan for developing a 1,200-acre site into a new capital center for Tehran. King of Iran. And the mayor decided that they would try to put a new city center in this vast piece of empty land in the middle of Tehran and decant some of the congestion around the old bazaar. And, and I was asked by Llewellyn Davis to come and put together a team that would design it, which I did. What did you learn from that experience that obviously endures? It's very, very difficult to design cities and have them implemented. That's why urban design is so tough. That's why very few architects have the stomach for it over time. Because they don't see it, they don't get any feedback. There's no gratification for the ego. You'll work 15 years on something and more likely than not it'll all go down the tube. Let's talk I, for a moment about your influences and your background. Was there a particular tradition of architecture? I, I just wanted to say one thing about how I got into architecture because I hated college. Uh, and I then realized that people were building models and drawing. And I said, what are you guys doing? And they said, we're studying architecture. And I said, you mean to say you can do this and go to college? <laughs> and uh, I thought that was fantastic. And I'd always liked to draw, but in the 50s, 40s, in high school, in a suburb, you never took art classes boys didn't do that. And so finally I went back to what I liked and I came home at Christmas, I mean spring vacation, the last day, the last hour, and I told my parents, I'm going to become an architect. And they looked at me as, as if I was crazy. And uh, my father said, is this another one of your tricks? <laughs> it was. <laughs> uh, <No> income. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And uh, that's, that's really, Barbara Lee, I promise you, that's not a made up story. That's Let's talk about your practice. How do people go about engaging the services of an architectural firm? That's what we'd like to know. <laughs> <laughs> Where are they? Yeah. <laughs> they're on their way. Yeah. So why don't you give them a little hint to lure them? Yeah. <laughs> you, you really get jobs on the recommendation of other people through networks, through people you know. Friends. And every now and then, someone sees something about you and says, this man is crazy enough to go with me. Let's try him. I wish it was more of an even exchange. I yeah. spent 10 years of my life recommending lots of architects for jobs when I wasn't in the business, and not as many of them have been <laughs> recommending me. <laughs> yeah. oh, it's not God. a two-way street. <laughs> now, they feel you don't need to be recommended. Yeah. What do you ask for? What do you look for in choosing an architect? You need a client, a responsive client, and that client's got to be able to live with the architect and feel a certain integrity, responsibility, being able to talk straight, say, listen, if it's going to cost you $500,000, tell them it's going to cost that because there's no way that you're not going to be found out about it. And I think if you're up front, and I think what's interesting, Barbara Lee, I've got to say that it's taken me 50 years to be up front. Uh, in other words, <laughs> when I was an architect at 30, uh, I wasn't talking this way put a foundation in the ground, you don't have a final bid, and suddenly the client says, you know, I'm trapped and you did it to me, and it's true, a lot of architects trap clients. The physical chemistry between you and your client is enormously important. They must trust you, because you've got to be able to give people bad news, and you've got to be able to tell them things that they may not want to hear and not think you'll lose the job. One of the worst things is architects trying to protect the job hiding information about cost overruns or you're behind schedule, which always happens. And unless you have a relationship in which you can say, I made a mistake, and not worry about getting fired, you're in trouble. So that the first relationship is one of trust. Why did you name houses by numbers rather than by identifying the clients? Now, I was really interested in, in uh, experiments, and I was interested for me, look, house one wasn't even a house. It was a toy museum, but I called it a house. The house is one of the most important things to learn things about architecture, and despite all the big scale buildings that we interested in doing and do do, one has a, and we always said we'd never do houses again, one goes back and says, there's always something to be learned from, and there's more architecture that you can do in a house because the program is so flexible. You try and do a commercial uh, office building, there isn't much flexibility. My line is even simpler than that. There is a long tradition of architects building houses as a way of coming to grips with the most pressing architectural issues, and one hopes it continues. Yeah. 
uh, and one continues to do that for that reason. Let's I talk very briefly about your current projects. Firstly, a components factory that you've designed for Cummins Engine in Madison, Wisconsin. In that instance, you relied on information and suggestions from factory workers for guidance. Was that an effective sort of collaboration? Oh, it's fantastic. Well, how do you involve them in the design of their own workspace, and how do you get them to trust you? Oh, God, a lot of long hours of drinking beer and uh, talking about things that they're interested in. They were really interested in, in making their plant, and you know, when they were there, they really believe, and I have to agree with them, that they had a large hand in where things went, the colors, the whole idea. They really believe in that plant. <laughs> You recently submitted a project plan for the Beverly Hills Civic Center competition. What was your intent there? <laughs> to win. <laughs> what did you propose that you hoped to win? This is one that Jack and I banged heads together on to begin with. It's, it's, it's one of the times when we really came up with a, f a format for working together, which I think was, it was very successful. Um, a couple of things we were really interested in. One was the notion of the street as an American place, not to recreate European plazas or the kind of um, malls, but to say people in Beverly Hills see each other in their cars and they want to be seen in their cars. And we thought we would want to try and find a way to bring the totemic object back into our civilization to restore a connection with something other than the day-to-day -day life. Our project was really a dialogue, which is the classic American confrontation again, between the natural landscape of Eden and what man builds in Eden. And we really attempted to exaggerate that dialogue and confrontation between landscape and language. I think that Jack and I, if our partnership stands for anything which is distinguishable from anyone else's, is that we have a great belief in two components of the art form, landscape and language. He stands for landscape and I stand for language if you want. But that's too easy. But we're looking at that dialogue that is man's most sophisticated form of communication in one hand and most refined and most abstract and another kind of sophisticated form of communication, landscape, which was an attempt to represent man's relationship to nature, to God. Are you guys still thought of as mavericks, or are your ideas more popular or more widely accepted today? Mm. I think some of the ideas, we're old on, so there's a, yeah, I think we're probably less maverick-like than we mm. were before. Uh, but no less experimental. I think we are thought of as establishment, unfortunately. I you, think you cannot be establishment until you really build a uh, lot and people get tired of it. They start looking for something else. Yeah. What would you like to be doing 10 years from now, Peter? If I could do two or three pieces of architecture that I, in myself, knew was architecture, and that somebody else, one of my colleagues, and probably Jack would be the one I would respect the most, that would say, hey, Peter, that's a piece of architecture. I'd be very happy. Mm. And not very many. I don't need very many. Do you ever expect it to unfold the way it has, Jack? I always suspected I'd have a partnership with someone like Peter because the dialogue is very important to me. And I don't have the kind of ego that can only see myself alone. I also suspect, suspect that I would go back to Virginia. I think the city of Richmond is a perfect city to work on. It's got a reasonably rational structure, and it's a city that I'd like to see Peter and I and our colleagues have a chance to do serious work on for the next 20 years. Is that a possibility? I hope so. We do, too. Thank you very much, Peter Eisman. Thank you, Jack Robertson, for being with us today.